take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 5. While you're turning there, I'll remind us that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, <clears throat> excuse me, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And I forgot to announce that the children can be dismissed at Children's Church. Uh, prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves, but grow by the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be all glory, both now and to the day of eternity. So we're back in um, Revelation chapter 5 this morning. We're going to hopefully conclude that this morning and uh, point out some important principles, some important things that we find here in Revelation chapter 5 that we did not see last time. So here we are, Revelation chapter 5. Last week we looked at these first three points. The Father is holding the sealed scroll and the call from the angel goes out searching for who is worthy to take the scroll. And if you remember going back to chapter 5 verses 2 and 3, that uh, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. And you recall that that is referring to the fact that there is no created being uh, who was worthy to take the scroll and to begin to break the seals. And then, of course, in verses 4 through 7, we see that the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is also the lamb that was slain, uh, is able to stand up and come and take the scroll from the Father. And in chapter 6, uh, he begins to break the seals and the contents of that scroll are revealed. Now, last week we did discuss real briefly about um, is this scroll, is it the title deed to the earth or is it a, it is a, is it a legal document that uh, presents the, the uh, judgments that are coming upon the earth? And I made the at least in my mind, I made the decision that it's a combination. First and foremost, it's, it's the title deed uh, to the earth. But I was listening to a conference yesterday, actually, on the book of Revelation, and I can't remember who was speaking, but something went off in my head, and I'm like, I think that that title deed, as he begins to break the seals, to me, it, it's like uh, an eviction notice. It's an eviction notice, you know. Uh, he's the owner and he begins to break the seals and begins to evict the inhabitants of the earth who have rejected him as Lord and Savior. It's, it's just, a, to me, it was an interesting way to look at it. And so um, the Lord Jesus be, steps up, takes the scroll from the Father's hand. And now in verses 8 through 14, we see the praise that is touched off by uh, the Lord Jesus being able, being worthy to receive the scroll and begin to break the seals. Now, when we get to verses 5 and 6, and this was something I was thinking about the other day, someone could argue, possibly, it had to be someone who didn't believe like we do, but someone could conclude from verses 5 and 6 that at that point, and it's really a moot point, but uh, that Christ's moral or ethical eligibility and his intrinsic capability to take the scroll and opened it are just merely theoretical uh, because he stands up and presents himself. However, when we get to verse 7 and on, we see very clearly that it's not just theoretical, but it's actual, that Jesus Christ is actually the only one who is worthy, and indeed the only one, uh, along with the, the remainder of the Godhead, who is worthy of all praise and worthy of the glory and honor and power and strength and majesty and on and on as it goes in these hymns of praise that we'll see as we go through the book of Revelation. So, we come to, to verse 8 then. Uh, in this portion, the heavenly hosts begin to worship. And in verse 8, it says, When he had taken the book, and remember, it's, it's a scroll. It's not a book. It's a scroll. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, we've already been introduced to the four living creatures and the, the four elders, 
or excuse me, the 24 elders. And we see that the, the four living creatures are variety, some, some variety of angelic beings. And so as we begin to study this, we look and we see that it's possible there are two major angelic companies that are listed in Scripture, the first being the seraphim. Um, I say the first, I believe the cherubs are mentioned in Genesis, but uh, the seraphim are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 2, and then cherubs and cherubim are mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, but for our purposes dealing with the book of Revelation, there's a close resemblance in what we find in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 5 and following, and then more information is given in chapter 10, verses 15, 17, and 20. So who are these four living creatures? Well, obviously they're angelic beings. We don't have any question about that, but are they the seraphim or are they the cherubim? And in Isaiah chapter 6, he writes that he, as he saw the Lord high and exalted, and he sees above the Lord uh, seraphim who were standing above him, each having six wings, and with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And then again in verse 6, he says, mentions that one of the seraphim flew, flew to him and had a burning coal in his hand. So we can see some similarities here between the four living creatures and the seraphim. But then again, when we come to Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel is by the river Chebar, and he sees the, these, this, um, uh, I believe it's a, it's a throne, it's a throne of God with wheels, and it's coming down to him. And in the midst of that, he sees four living beings, he says in verse 5 of chapter 1. He says, uh, and this was their appearance, they had human form. And each of them had four faces and four wings. And then again in Ezekiel 10, he says, Then the cherubim robes up, and these are the living beings that I saw by the river Chebar. And so he identifies those four living beings. Now, the only real difference I see between the, the cherubim and the seraphim is, is, number one, the difference in the number of wings. The seraphim have six, the cherubim have four uh, the seraphim speak, um, and I think I got that backwards. Well, the seraphim speak here in Isaiah, um, and the cherubim also speak. That's not a distinction. So I don't know why I put that down there, but thanks for listening anyway. Um, and then the cherubim, each of them have four faces and not simply one, whereas in the 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 four living beings, they each have a single face, or at least it's described that way. So it could be that these four living creatures are a completely different category of angelic being. So uh, it's just an interesting thing to look at to see the variety of God's creation. And we see that same thing in humanity. I mean, we look around and we see none of us look the same. And even, even, uh, parents, their children, you can see the resemblance in their children uh, many times, uh, but they're not the same. I, I grew up with uh, playing basketball with a pair of twins back in high school. And although they were very similar, they were distinct. And you could tell, I mean, well, I say that. I always struggled to remember which one was which, and I knew them most of my life. Um, but you, you could tell, eventually, you could figure out which one was which because of the distinctions. And it's just, I'm just saying all this to point out, here's, it's not mentioned in the passage, and yet this is another uh, reason that God is to be praised. Because we see in His creation the variations, the, His, his art, artistry, uh, His creativity in what He has created. Now, I'm going to be interested in, in seeing these beings when I get, get to heaven because, I mean, if you read these details about how they look, this is not anything we've ever seen before except maybe in some sci-fi movie, and I don't think any of those could even match what we're going to see when we, when we stand before the Lord and, and, and are able to see these angelic beings. All right, so anyway, we move on then. We see the 24 elders and we see that these 24 elders join with the four living creatures falling down before the Lamb. But these 24 elders, it says, are holding 
Harps, each one is holding a harp, and each one is holding a golden bowl full of incense. And then it goes on and says, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, when we come to these 24 elders, we've already identified them as being the church. And I continue to hold that because, first of all, uh, they're clothed in white. We find that description back in chapter 4 and verse 4. They're, they're clothed in white, and that is part of the promise that Jesus made to those who overcome back in chapters, in, excuse me, in chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Secondly, these 24 elders, if you recall back in uh, verse 4 of chapter 4 again, they're wearing crowns. Once again, a symbol of something that was promised to the overcomers by the Lord Jesus Christ back in chapter 2 and verse 20 and in chapter 3 and verse 11. Thirdly, they're seated on 24 thrones, which once again is another promise to the overcomers that Jesus Christ made uh, in Revelation 4, 4, uh, in Revelation 3, 21, and then in Revelation 2, 26. Uh, Paul mentions this, something that would allude to this, I believe, in 2 Timothy 2, 12, where he says that, that if we are faithful, we will reign with him. And then again, in Revelation 20 and verse 4, we see these same 24 elders uh, seated upon the thrones. And it is one of the promises. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Matthew 19, verse 28, where Jesus is speaking to the apostles, well, the disciples at the time. He's speaking to the disciples and told them that uh, when he returns, that they would sit upon 12 thrones governing the tribes of Judah. Okay, so this is not an unfamiliar picture. And I think that they could be included in this 24 simply because the the 12 uh, apostles, excuse me, 12 disciples, you try this sometimes, it's really easy. Uh, the 12 disciples um, are the foundation of the church. They, they form the, the foundation uh, gifted men of the church. And so that it could be that they're included in these 24 elders. So in verse 8 here, then we see something added and that is that we see the realization of their priestly duties because the harps and, and the golden bowls full of incense reflect uh, priestly uh, duties uh, from the Old Testament um, symbolism that we have. So back in chapter 1 of Revelation, if you recall, in verses 5 and 6, uh, it mentions Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead... And the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, he has made us to be a what? A kingdom, priest to his God and Father. Okay? So the church, and this is, that was uh, John's adoration of the Lord. The church uh, is, is a section or a division of a priesthood uh, through uh, our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see here in chapter 8, that the church in heaven is taking up their priestly duty. Uh, they're holding these golden bowls of incense. And of course, once again, he, he interprets uh, what he means by this incense. And the incense is the prayers of the saints. Now, we see a similar thing about the prayers of the saints back in Psalm chapter 141 and verse 2. May my prayer be counted as incense before you, the lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. And so these prayers of the saints um, come from these golden bowls. These golden bowls themselves, as uh, Robert Thomas says in his commentary, that were the kind of receptacles that belong to the Old Testament author, uh, excuse me, Old Testament altar. And he goes on and says that in Old Testament worship, the offering of incense was the prerogative of, of the priest. And so we see the church in heaven at this time taking up a responsibility of their priesthood. Um, and this in the in in other passages as we move through the book of Revelation it's going to it's going to relate to the Lord Jesus bringing justice for his people uh, who have been so tormented by this earthly system. All right? So the, the ministry as a kingdom of priests to his God and Father is demonstrated uh, both by the possession, I believe, of the, uh, harps of gold, uh, the harps and the bowls of gold full of the prayers of the saints. 
And at that time, then all 28 members here, the, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down and begin to worship. But who are the saints? Who are the saints that are mentioned here? The prayers that fill these bowls belong to saints, but who are these saints? And most people would just simply say, well, it's all the saints of all all time, which is obviously, I believe, a possibility, but I think a better answer belongs to ver- chapters like uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, where the Lamb breaks the fifth seal, and he says, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And there was given to each of them white robes, and they were told uh, that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed. And so these are the saints that I believe these prayers belong to. And I think that chapter 8, verses 1 through 6 also lend credence to that. These angels came uh, and they had bowls and the, and the incense in the bowls are the prayers of the saints, it says in verse 4. So again, it, it's possible that it is all the saints of all time, but I think it's more likely that it belongs to the saints who are martyred during the tribulation period. I love it when I make a slide and then forget to use it. Okay. So verse 9 then, they begin to sing a new song, it says here. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God your, with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So as the 24 elders and the four living creatures bow down to to worship, they begin to sing this new song. And the word new here, it does, it, you can, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it does have the, have the meaning of something that is new as in not old. And it can mean that. But it also carries uh, the meaning that I think is, is used here, that it is in respect to its form, its quality, it's something that has never been used, it's novel. So it's a new song. Uh, Sort of like, yeah, I haven't written a song in forever, but it's sort of like when I would sit down to write a song, that song that I produced had never been written before, at least not in the form that I did it. Now, probably wasn't worth listening to, but it was new, okay? Um, And so that's, I believe, what they're speaking of here. All right, and what is the song dealing with? It's dealing with the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy and it begins to present to us the reasons why he is worthy. And it's listed here in the passage. First of all, he is, he is worthy because it says you were slain. And of course we know, and that's the symbolism of the lamb that had been slain. It's, a, it's Jesus Christ who gave himself as an offering for the sins of man. But not only that, it mentions the fact that he had purchased for God... Uh, with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. What is he referring to here? Well, it's very simple. He divides, divides the population, the mankind's population, into each individual group. Uh, he begins with the tribe, which refers to those who are biologically related. It refers to the tongue, which obviously is the is same language. So these these people have the same language. And so you can see he's going, he's, basically what it's doing is it's, it's making sure there's no one left out. There's going to be representatives from every imaginable section of humanity. Peoples refers to those with common cultural bonds and territory. Nation obviously refers to every nationality, which would include people with same culture, people speaking the same tongue, and even people who are biologically related. So he works from the lesser to the greater here, and he just simply is saying that out of every possible people group, language, tongue, color, background, culture, doesn't matter, the Lord Jesus Christ, by his blood, has purchased for God people that meet every criteria that is fulfilled here or that is mentioned here. 
So he mentions that he was slain. We know from John chapter 1, verse 29, Jesus Christ, uh, when encountering John the, the, uh, John the baptizer, John looks up and he sees Jesus coming to him. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then again in 1 John 3 and verse 5, he says that you know that Jesus Christ appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. And then again, once we get to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, it's going to say this, that in reference to the beast, that all who dwell on the earth, there's that earth dwellers concept again, all of those who dwell on the earth will worship the beast, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. And so Jesus Christ is worthy because he was slaughtered. The, the, he, the, excuse me, the Greek word here speaks of a lamb that has been slaughtered. And he was slain, slaughtered for our sins. And by his blood, the blood of his sacrifice, he was able to purchase for God people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And then the third reason he is worthy of all praise, it says here, is because you have made them. Now, who is the them? Well, this seems, and this is, I don't know if I should call it speculation or, or what, or summation, whatever. Here we have a third group presented to us as a kingdom and priests. Now, I'm not saying that there are three different kingdoms. That's not at all what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not even really saying that there are three different um, uh, groups of priests, but it's just interesting that the church age saints are made a kingdom and priests. We know that, uh, that there are priests in the coming kingdom in the Levitical priesthood um, that will be established when the Lord Jesus establishes his kingdom here on earth. And now there's this group of tribulation saints um, who are identified as a kingdom and priests. Now it could be that, that the church age saints and the tribulation saints form one priesthood. It, that information is just simply not given. I just thought it was interesting that here we have a third group uh, who are identified as a kingdom and priests. All right, so that's the third reason Christ they proclaim his worth or his worthiness. And then we go on in verses 11 and 12, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures are joined in a chorus by a group that is beyond number. It says in verse 11, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Okay, and so here we have the word many here is a Greek word that speaks of a great or large number, but it doesn't stop there. He goes on and he adds that there are myriads. The word myriad, the Greek word myriad means 10,000. The fact that it's plural and then added another plural, we're looking at 10,000s of 10,000s and then added to that thousands of thousands. And this is really familiar language uh, from the Old Testament, the heavenly host. We could see in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 19, Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 2. And then again in Psalm 68, verse 17. I'm not going to read the other two, but I'm going to read Psalm 68, verse 17. It speaks of the fact that the chariots of God are myriads, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them as at Sinai in his holiness. And then again in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10, which is where this scene is first described in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10, what do we see? Well, we see the ancient of days in verse 9 has been, has been seated. And then in verse 10, it says, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. And the court sat, and the books were open. This is the scene that we're looking at here. And that opening, that receiving of the book prior to its opening, just elicits this huge 
chorus from all of the heavenly hosts, those who are beyond number. And John looks at this crowd and he says, I don't think even the park service in Washington, D.C. could number this crowd. It's too many. It's too far beyond number. So this group then joins together proclaiming that Christ is worthy. That again, that word worthy, if you recall, we discussed it last week. It, it means that, that he is eligible because of his being to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So then in uh, verses 13 and 14, every created being joined in praise to God and the Lamb. Look what it says. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And so here, once again, we have this great division splitting up each section of creation. And what we see here, once again, we could go back to the Old Testament and see the same type of praise being written about in the Psalms. For instance, in Psalms 96, uh, verses 11 through 13, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all it contains let the field exult in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. But not only that, we can come back over to the Greek scriptures and we can see Paul mentioning something about this scenario, at least uh, something related to it. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where Paul says, for this reason also God highly exalted him, Jesus Christ, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And so here, as these, the, the heavenly chorus begins to sing, it is joined by every created thing in the entire universe. And I think, as one scholar said, that when it mentions those who are under the earth, it quite possibly could be describing those who have died without Christ and the demonic realm, fallen angels who had rebelled against God, and now they are forced to sing praise to their creator. So that is the picture we get. And think of it this way we will be there as part of that chorus. Any who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, we will be included. We will be, if you can't carry a tune in a bucket with a handle, and believe me, I've heard some of you sing. Um, we do have some good singers here that I wish I could get up here that would start singing. But anyway, I'll let that die for now. If, you, if you've always wanted to be able to sing, when you stand in that chorus, you're going to be able to sing. And to God's ears, it's going to be the most beautiful thing he's ever heard. Because we're going to have our new bodies. Uh, we're going to have our new vocal cords. We'll have new abilities that we don't have now. And one of those is going to be that we're going to be able to sing a beautiful chorus of praise to our Heavenly Father and God, uh, the Lord Jesus, our Savior. There are 14 hymns, at least, in the book of Revelation. And interestingly enough, we have found five here in chapters 4 and 5. So these are things, uh, especially when, when you're, you know, I think uh, uh, David mentioned the time in which we live. And, and then as Jim was praying, he, he prayed about our, the situations we have going on around us. And when you get overwhelmed um, by life's issues, you know, a lot of times we'll say, well, you, you should go to the Psalms and read Psalms. And that's, 
that's obviously true. We should. We should go there. I mean, we find comfort. We find instruction, things like that. But also, uh, we have some psalms here in the book of Revelations that we can go and we can read these praises to God and be reminded who it is that we worship, who it is we serve, who it is that we owe our allegiance to. And we find five of those 14 hymns in chapters 4 and 5. And obviously, as we walk through the remainder of the book together, we will look at the other hymns that are listed in the book. But there's some other issues. I love it when I do this and then forget all about it. Well, I read these already. So anyway, so here's what we've looked at in chapter 5. We've seen the father holding the sealed scroll. No one able to, to come and receive that after the call goes out in verses 2 and 3. But in verses 4 through 7, we see the lamb that was slain, the lion of Judah, who is able to come and take the scroll from the father's hand. And then we see the worship that breaks forth because of that great act there are some other things that we need to look at, though. There are some theological topics that, that are quite, uh, not just interesting, but necessary. Uh, how many of you have uh, little figurine angels at home that are little fat babies? I'm not going to say throw them away, but I'm going to say that's not an accurate, accurate depiction. Let's just put it that way. We see a lot about angels in, in the whole book of Revelation, but we see a lot about them here also. For chapter 4 and 5 reveals several details. Uh, we see divisions of the angelic beings because these four living creatures are identified specifically as four living creatures for a reason. They're distinct from other, not just other created beings, but other angelic beings. And we've looked at the seraphim and the cherubim uh, being different creatures here also. But we also see part of their duty is to worship and serve God. And also an extension of their service to God is to minister to mankind. And so here we see part of their duty is to join in. And I think some people think, well, the chorus is, is just, the, just the human beings singing the chorus. And I don't think so. I think it's the whole angelic host, including the angelic beings, because you go back to Isaiah, what do we find? The angels are continually circling the throne of God, singing. It says saying, but what is singing other than saying something longer? Some of you will get that when you go home. Um, but it's what it is. It's, it's, you're saying something, but you're using different intonations and lengthier, um, 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 what's the word? Um, say what? Lengthier vowels? Okay, well, I, I'll go with that. Well, it, it, it's still saying something. So the angels are continually around the throne, holy, 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 right? And so I believe the angelic beings are also uh, ministering to God by singing his praises day and night. And then we see a theology of worship, uh, which is related to theology proper, which is uh, a study of God uh, the Father, um, and then Christology, which is the study of Christ. What does the Bible say about Christ? And we see a theology of worship here because what does worship mean? It means it's f literally from worthship. It's, a, uh, it's uh, proclaiming someone's worth. Okay? And so who has more worth than God the Father and God the Son, as we see here in Revelation chapter 5. They are, they are the ones who are worthy to receive the power and the glory and the wisdom and the might and the dominion and, and you keep going on and they keep adding with each new hymn. They're adding more and more because they're the ones who are worth receiving that. So why do we worship God and Jesus Christ? Is it, is it that we worship God for what he does for us? Well, there's an aspect of that that is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with worshiping God or proclaiming his worth or proclaiming the worth of the Lord Jesus because of what he has done for us and what he is doing for us. But at the heart of that is the fact that he is worthy of our worship and no one else is. And so these hymns that we find in the book of Revelation and in particular here in 4 and 5 remind us of the inestimable, inest, let's say that three times together, inestimable, inestimable, I just do that so that you can have something to laugh at. I, I, usually, I don't have any problem with the English language. So anyway, I talk good, okay? 
So the hymns remind us that he is worthy of our praise and Christ is worthy here to take the book, the scroll, and to begin to break the seals. His sacrifice demonstrates his worth. And that's not, I'm not saying that simply because he did that for us, but because it was accepted by God demonstrates the worthiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have Christology and a related field, soteriology. I'm throwing these terms out so that you know what they are. Most of you already do. Some of you may not. Christology, the study of Christ. The soteriology is the study of salvation. And this is um, the point that continues to come back at us in chapters 4 and 5 is, is soteriology as it relates to Christology. Christ redeemed man. And he redeemed all of creation. What does that mean to redeem? Well, it means to purchase. It means to pay a price for something. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, it refers to the fact that Jesus Christ paid our ransom. He purchased the church by his blood in Acts 20, 28. He paid the highest price, as Peter tells us in 1 Peter, and that price was his own life, the shedding of his own blood. You were bought with a price, something that is much more valuable than gold or silver. That price was his blood, as we find in Ephesians 1 and verse 7. He did it to forgive our sins, Colossians 1, 14, and to purify us for himself. And so if you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved because of the redemption that Jesus Christ purchased with his blood to forgive the sins of mankind. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, and as Paul says in Acts chapter 16, that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Until that point of time, you are separated from God by your sin, and you're doomed to receive the same punishment that Satan and his demons will receive and all rebellious mankind. So I would plead with you today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I would ask that you would do that now simply by trusting him, believing in him, and what he has done on your behalf. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and he offers to you salvation. It is free to you because he's paid for it with his own blood. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that we've handled it correctly this morning. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you would be glorified from it and we would be edified. Lord, help us to leave this place today more zealous to live a life that reflects who you are and who we are in Christ. <clears throat> and Father, we pray for Khan Vu and Dawn and their children. And Lord, we ask that you would bring Khan back to full health. Lord, even now as the dialysis runs through his body, that, uh, that you would strengthen him and heal him, Lord. And we will be sure to praise you for that. We thank you again for the, the healing of baby Caitlin and her family and for bringing her home to her mother and father. Lord, we look forward to the day that we are all completely healed when we receive our new bodies and we stand before you and are able to sing these praises to you, for you truly are worthy. We thank you for loving us, and we pray that you help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and sing with me.